Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I see, I see a few attendees already. Maybe the others will come in later, but we're going to start. Um, again, thanks for attending this webinar. My name is Mel Clemente. I've been with Kidabra for 10 years now, building InfoPath forms and still loving it. So yeah, I'm excited to talk about how you can edit data from multiple lists using just one form. And I hope you're as excited as I am. Without further ado, um, I don't want any questions yet. <laughs> so, all right, so we talk about our key takeaways first. I'd like to show you how you can bypass list form limitations today. We know that you're not able to add repeating data in a, in a list form, right? It's not your usual full-fledged InfoPath form that allows you to add repeating and non-repeating data in just uh, the main data source. Um, and you're, for example, you're going to think about an expense report, for example, if your organization uses a form to submit their expenses, you usually will have uh, a list that will contain the parent data, is what we call it, um, to, for example, store the total expenses, uh, like the business or the purpose of the expense, and then a separate list with the itemized expenses, which can be multiple items. Uh, that's what you can call the child list, right? So a list form today um, does not allow that. And we can actually, with the help of Forms Viewer, which is Kidabra's main recipe these days, we can upgrade your list forms, Forms Viewer enable them, and do bypass just that limitation and more, actually. So along with that, I'm going to show you how you can generate PDF using the external data, because again, the data from the repeating uh, list, the list items, won't be stored in the form's main data source. And, and so that means that you're not going to be able to print it or include that in your printed PDF. I think Flow does not allow that either, SharePoint workflows, because um, if you connect them if you connect your form to Flow, for example, it's going to need to know which data or which source to extract the data from in order to generate that PDF, right? And it needs to reside within the form data in that case. So using Forms Viewer, we can also, that that, that is also possible. Okay. And so again, today we're going to talk about these three items. Um, being able to edit multiple items, uh, list items from just one form. Um, along with that, we're going to query the other lists and show them as repeating data on our form canvas so that we can think of everything as a whole. And I'll show you how you can add your edit and submit rules to update and, you know, to just update and submit the repeating data to your separate list. And then later on, how you can print or add rules to do the generating PDF logic using the external data. Okay, so um, we're going to start by customizing the list template because you, can, you can't just like design it right there in the stock um, InfoBath uh, list, right? So you're going to download the template. Uh, I think it only works in Internet Explorer. I haven't tried in other browsers. Maybe Edge would support it, but definitely not in Chrome. So you're going to download and customize the list template. We're going to have to uh, associate the child repeating list by adding it as a data connection. Um, so in my example today, I'd like to show you um, an order form. So think about an order form that has the order number for in the parent list, for example. Um, what else? A customer name, the shipping address, and then the child list or the child repeating data being the itemized orders. So here's our secondary data source. We're going to have to add it to our list form. Um, query it and display the data. And in order to be able to modify the child uh, items, it needs to exist in the main data source. At least one, um, even though this is not repeating in the main, at least we need a placeholder for each one of those uh, element in the list, in the child list. So here we've got item ID that maps to this ID from the order items. We've got the item which is the description, item or description, quantity, um, the price of the order, and the item cost, which is the um, 
product of your quantity types of the price, right? So there you are going to add your placeholder. Um, and you can, I'll show you the order, I'll show you the lists later, but these additional columns, because they're only placeholders, they will be part of the like columns, they will be like columns in the list, but you can just hide them from the main view, right? Then we're going to upload our form, our customized list form to Forms Viewer, so we can add our um, secret ingredient, <laughs> the cure rules, and then configure our list mapping um, so we can allow editing and submitting. Um, before I actually show you the next slide, let me show you our, list, our lists here. Okay, so here's our orders list. This is our parent list. And here's our order items list, the child list. Right now, I don't have anything, but I've configured this to my parent um, orders list to open in Forms Viewer using the template I provided. And to those who doesn't know how to customize a list form or download it, let me just show you real quick. Here in Internet Explorer, we've got the tasks list. Um, tasks list being always a part of a SharePoint site, right? It comes default. It's one of the lists there. So you just go to list and customize an info path, like on this guy here. It'll open an info path designer. And then it's all just going to be a matter of saving it locally and customizing it starting your, 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 you know, adding your additional fields like the placeholder I was talking about earlier and um, uploading it to QRules. So here are the default uh, columns in this task list. So if I show advanced view, I can then go ahead and add new fields into this uh, list form, right? And again, each field here will be like uh, an equivalent to, to a column in the list. But then again, um, I'm not able to add a repeating group in here. That's the limitation I was talking about earlier. Um, so then I'll just save this one on my machine. And let's call this the task form. Uh, once I got that saved, I'd go to Forms Viewer. And by the way, this webinar is um, targeting Forms Viewer users because um, it is Forms Viewer dependent. So I assume that you're already familiar with Forms Viewer here and you know what you're seeing right now. So here in our uh, Manage templates, I'm just going to need to upload that list form that I saved locally. Mm -hmm. This is the one and click Upload. So then once, that is, uh, once that's uploaded, I can then click Design. It'll take me to the Forms Designer page. And this is where I can inject my form with Cure Rules. So those are the first few steps to Forms Viewer enable your form, any form. So um, uh, one of, an, uh, another key takeaway of this, uh, this webinar topic today is if you have, yeah, sure, again, you can, you can use an info a full-fledged InfoBath form that will contain your parent and your child uh, repeating data. But what if you already have an existing list form that you've been using in your organization and you know there are already existing items in there and it's gonna be hard to move things over to a new or a separate full-fledged info path form and that your only choice is to stick with that list form. So this will be very uh, useful for you. Um, yep, so now I got my task form injected with cure rules and ready for me to customize according to my needs, but we're not going to use the task form. I've already prepared an order form for today's demo. Um, and so let me close this guy, going back to our orders list then. If I click new item, instead of the usual uh, SharePoint list displaying in the browser. This is going to display in Forms Viewer. And you'll see here that I, I got a nice design. And if I show you this just real quick here in the designer, if I open this in InfoPath Designer, all you'll see on the canvas is a plain Jane design, plain Jane uh, layout, like no coloring buttons or just the default buttons. But then how come it in the browser, in Forms Viewer, it's displaying with a theme, like a like Cadaver's theme, 
those buttons, right? And that is all because this form also uses a style CSS, um, which Cure Rules can load into our form. I'm going to show you here in the designer. If I go to Cadabra Rules, finished loading. Um, I say load style, so I specify my CSS file here. So on load, I would don't I don't want you to use the default InfoPath uh, theme. Use the theme that I specified in my CSS file. So um, I know some of you might be already familiar with that technique that we're doing. And as you notice here, whenever I expand my window or scrunch it down, my form just, uh, my, my form content just automatically adjusts to my screen width. And again, that's happening um, via that CSS file. This will help if you, your users are opening the form in their mobile device. And so whatever, how small, however small or uh, large my screen, my device screen is, whether it portrait we are in landscape mode, the form would just um, fit right there in my screen. And that's via the CSS, just the bonus. <laughs> okay, so here we are with our order form. I'm gonna start filling this out. Um, let's say our customer is myself. I want to order from Kadabra. We see order number here is blank. It will auto-generate when we submit the form. And I'd like you to ship it to a dummy address for now. Um, something like that. Then I'll start adding uh, my orders, my itemized orders. So I'm going to say I'm going to order a uh, MacBook Pro. Um, just one, and it's pretty expensive. So it does all the calculations for us, and uh, you know how to do that. It's just simple rules, calculation rules. Um, let's say I'm going to just add some antivirus, if I can spell correctly. Um, maybe two from my other machine, and I'll be something like that. Shipping cost um, would be zero. Okay, so now if I, so again, this is my parent data. This is the data that's going to get submitted to my parent orders list, all right? And this repeating data down here is what gets submitted to my order items list, um, with each row here being each individual item in that list. So I can go ahead and add, I'll keep adding more, but that's okay for now. Let's submit our form. And... Okay, behind the scenes, it's trying to submit to both those lists from the single form. On submit, it, we were going to get this prompt. We can go back or close our form. If we go back, maybe you want to add more items, make any changes. This pencil icon is important because we need to be able to edit this current row. The form needs to know which row we are currently editing. And so. Um, as you know, if you uh, configure SharePoint list mapping, the item that you will submit needs an ID to associate. Um, you know, you're going to tell your form update this row from this list using that ID. Okay. So um, let me just say, let's let me just change this to MacBook Air or something. Um, before I resubmit this, let's refresh our list just so you can see that our first submit was successful, and now we see that one item, all right, that contains my shipping address, customer name, subtotal, and then the total. And here in our order items, if we refresh here, we're going to end up with two rows, one for each of those items, okay? And it, um, it assigned order number 10 because this is the list item ID, okay? Now if I go back to my form here and I I didn't close it. I'm just continuing to edit. Now if I edit this, so I changed the name of MacBook. I'm going to edit my antivirus to be three now and it will auto calculate again and we'll resubmit. Okay, so we have received our order. Let's refresh our items again. This should refresh because our total changed, total values changed. As we can see, it did. And here in our order items, we have new 
grows. <laughs> so that's a bug. It's supposed to update these existing uh, rows. So why didn't that happen? So I got a bug there, and we can fix it on the fly here, just so you know that we're live. We're real here. Um, okay. So it's supposed to update these two guys instead of creating new rows. All right. But then let's go back here. Let me show you what printing does, um, I guess. Uh, or, okay, yeah, I can show you that now. Um, let's click on the print button. So here we're actually using a separate form to print all this because we know our parent data is, uh, and our child repeating data, they're not part of one data source. They're coming from different data sources. So now we have this PDF opened in a separate window. Let me make this bigger. So, um, and, and so I have a different print view that is um, printer friendly, I guess, more readable, um, less coloring, you know, better in the eyes and with good formatting there. So that's my printed PDF. You can also set this to, you know, send an email using Flow or whatnot. But okay, let's see how we're doing things here um, behind the scenes. Let me just uh, switch to my slide deck again. You see, I have to open. So I already showed you how uh, uh, the result of that print, but then the, the trick behind that is again we're using a separate XSN that has all the data in just one source in one data source and a separate view for for our printing and we can get crazy with that view however we want to design it however we want our printed PDF to look like. All right, and then um, for that data for that other XSN to have all the data we need to copy it co copy the data from our current list form into that other XSN. And then the magic works in such this render form curls command is able to generate that PDF for us without us having to write the code. Curls does it for us. Okay, so let's see here. This is our form, order form, and this is our main data, our parent data. And down here, it is not part of the main data source. What it is, it, it's a secondary data source here that I added as a as a receive data connection. This is the one order items. If I modify this, it's just the it's just the SharePoint list query connecting to my site there, and uh, it allowed me to to select the columns that I want to bring in to this order list form. So I selected my order items list, and then these were the columns that I wanted to add their title, item, quantity, price. Trigger is just the help field, it, so we're hiding that in the list view, but that's necessary for my rules to fire for each row. I'll talk about that later. Cost, and then um, that's it. So then that's my order item, secondary data source. So what's, what's happening here is on form open, going back here in Kidabra rules, looking at finish loading, which acts as, you know, um, same as your form load rules here. So after I load my style, I want to display my form, you know, in my using my theme. I then load the items, and this is only if um, if there is no. Let me see here. This is only if um, we're opening an existing form that we submit. So after we submit it, we want to query all the list items um, that are associated for that order. And I think uh, this is where our bug is. We didn't close the form, and so the IDs did not get stored in the uh, somewhere here. I think I think that's it. I'm trying to think it in my head. I'm gonna we're gonna to try to debug that later. So again, we're loading this item, we're loading the items for uh, forms that are not new, querying the order um, items list with the title being or, okay, that's a query field, the title, being the ID field of our main data source because again, we're using this one here in the order items. This 10 is actually the order number. We go to our order list that is also 10 which is also this uh, this it's actually this list items ID that we're passing in as a title in our uh, order items list so that controls the association of the parent and the child items 
okay? So we then query that and bring it into our form, show it right here. Um, and then uh, we're, we're showing uh, two separate controls, one that's not editable, read-only, and one that is editable for each of these guys. And the purpose being, when they click on this pencil icon, that's the time we want them to be able to edit that row. And what this pencil icon does, it just sets our helper field, the trigger field here, to uh, a value. So we call we we just uh, specify it to edit here. Okay, so our form knows that I edited this first item, or I edited I edited the third line item, and whatnot. So then on submit here, I have I have in my rules, initial submit for ID. And initially, I want to submit to my um, to, to get an order number, right? So submit this form initially, so I get the ID back, and set that as my title. Okay, right here. And so again, that controls our uh, our association. Um, then we're going to submit the parent I, uh, parent list data order setting the subtotal, total, and that's it for our rules because all the other uh, fields here are user entry, okay? And data is auto-populated on firm open for us. And then once you submit that order, you submit the itemized orders, okay, if there's any. And the way we do this is we use the set value command to trigger, set, set the trigger field to submit. So whichever rows I edited here, you can look at this. I said, set the value in order items. We specify the X path where trigger equals edit. So whichever rows we clicked that pencil icon from, we then set it to the value submit. So we're, we're we're basically triggering that submit. So then looking at that helper field, we have rules here. So if trigger equals submit, then set the main data source with that current rows value. That's how um, each of the individual rows in our secondary data source get submitted. So for example, here we set the placeholder field that we added in the main data source, item ID, with that current rows ID coming from order items, okay? And the same goes for all of the other actions here. We set the title, um, hold on here. I think this could be, a, this could be where our bug is. Um, okay, but I don't think we need this rule anyway. Um, this item should come from the main data source, so we're setting item to be the equivalent of that order items, row, item, okay? Yeah, I'm trying to think if we need this one, maybe maybe it's the cost of the issue before, but yep, yeah, all these guys should be, the, fe the, the field that we're trying to set should come from the main data source and the value we're trying to set it to is that uh, current context row. And then we call the command, submit to SharePoint list using the order items mapping. Okay, so that's all happening on submit, and uh, let me show you the SharePoint list mapping, by the way. So uh, I showed you in the slide that you also need to configure the SharePoint list mappings. This is how we, we are controlling which field in the form should submit to which column in the list, all right? So right now you see three uh, mapping names here specified. So if we look at order, this is the parent mapping. Submitting to the orders list, the parent list. And then I'm specifying the ID to be the actual ID. Title will be mapped to the title and so on. So I, um, I'm assuming you are familiar with using this mapping tool. Um, but if you need help, if you can provide um, some YouTube links showing this uh, video links, showing this technique. So yep just mapping fields to which columns in there. It's all self-explanatory. Order number here is after my initial submit, remember my submit button is gonna try to first submit the order number. So um, in the orders list, uh, submit, I just map the ID column and specify that here in the options to be the ID. And when I return that back, that's the time my order 
uh, mapping will kick in, will get submitted to the parent, and then my order items, which is mapped to the order items list this time, and coming from those placeholder fields that I added in my main data source, so item ID, title, quantity, price, the ones I showed you before. Okay, and then telling them to map or submit to these columns in my child list. Okay, so that's all the magic behind this. Um, for let's go back to our submit button, making sure that we're not missing anything. So yeah, I'm submitting the order order details, and then there's the prompt to allow us if we want to go back to the form and edit it, or just straight close. And if they pick they click close form, then we'll just close the form here. So we got a condition there. So that's something that you you also cannot add um, without forms viewer without curls. Um, like dynamic prompts and whatnot. Okay, so uh, the print, then the printing logic here. Okay, so let me show you our separate print form because we said that we need a separate form for printing. Here's our guy here, and this is where I designed it in a more printer friendly view, I'd say got my details there and notice now I have all the data in one data source which is the main data source I've got my this is going to be order details going to be the main data main um, yeah the parent data and then order items will be the child repeating data so what you need to do then in this print button in your order form your actual order form you're going to have to find a way to copy the data over into your other form. And how are we doing that? We simply added the data source, this forms, our print forms data source, as a secondary data source in our order form. This one here, order form data. So we just added this as, a, as an XML data source right here. So right here we can see order form data.xml. Okay, and it's it's actually easy to create XMLs out of existing um, InfoBath forms if you just want to extract the, the schema, like uh, the yeah the schema schema there. If I preview this, this is actually an XML already, and I can save it, save as. See how its uh, its extension is XML because when I previewed that, it's already providing me the the underlying XML for that for this particular form. Okay, and once I save that, that's um, I can then use that as my secondary or add that as a secondary data source in my main form right here. That's what we're doing. So then, from this list form, you're going to need to populate. The, this, uh, these fields with the corresponding values, right? And th the way we're doing that, just to make things easier, and we know how to create an XSLT, um, like code it, code an XSLT, right? Um, we are just using transform, but in your ordinary uh, world, I guess you can just simply use set a field value, set, uh, for example, set ID, set this ID to be the ID field here from the main data source, right? Um, set the back in the order form data, set the customer to whatever customer value was in the main data source and things like that. And also populate this order item with the actual order items from this from a different secondary data source. And it can get complicated depending on how many fields your form has, how, how big your form is, right? But we're just doing that using transform. That's how we're copying the data over to that other data source. And so then we call the generate, uh, we generate the PDF by using the render form curls command. We will want it formatted as a PDF. And then here's where we specify the name of our other form, print, print order form, and then which data to use to render that, uh, to uh, where to get the data. So this is what we're talking about when we say we can print from an external data because this is actually a secondary data source, right? And then which view do you want to print from that other form, okay? Um, and so once that all that is set, uh, the next thing you should do is to go to your forms viewer instance and upload that other template 
into here. So right now you can see I have another template instance where my print order form is uploaded. Okay, so that's how when I go to my order form and click print, it's as if talking to my other template right here to use the template, whatever's in here, to pass in the data and then use the view I specified in order to generate this PDF. Okay, I hope that all makes sense, but we saw how the magic happened and um, what I'm going to try to do next is to fix that. But I guess um, let's see if we open this submitted item and I think I have this working correctly till my last minute changes that apparently broke things. <laughs> but trying to open this, now we have uh, four items here. Let me just, I wish I have added a, a delete feature in this uh, demo form, but I did not. So let me just um, enter some dummy data, test one. And this is not gonna be editable until I click on this pencil. Now these bottom items should update in the orders list and if it doesn't, let's see what I can do, what I will do. <laughs> okay, um, all right, let me refresh order items. It should have modified those two items down, which it did. So I guess I have all that update logic um, in place when you reopen a submitted form, but not during the same session. Because um, if you notice, I kept that new form session open and I just kept clicking um, go back. So I guess that's where the issue was. Um, I'm gonna find a way to actually um, allow updates right on that first new session um, and send an updated form in, your, in the sample package that comes to the, after this webinar, you're gonna be receiving the package, the sample forms that we use today. Um, but I think that's it. Uh, let me go back here to my slide. I think I've covered everything. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Our floor is open for questions. Right now I'm not seeing anything. Gonna wait here. And I do hope you you find, uh, you found some value during our webinar during today's topic. Looks like someone raised his hand, but not seeing it anymore. Okay, looks like we don't have any. Okay, here we go. From Tim Hudson, what's the level of security? Is it approved by federal government in SharePoint Online? Not sure how to address that. Um, as far as security goes, what I do know is our forms viewer, uh, let's see here, forms viewer is indeed secure in that our our server is, uh, we're using Azure to store just the templates. We're not storing any data per se. So it's just a um, matter of uh, using forms viewer as a repository of all your form solutions. Right, but uh, not necessarily data. Right. Um, you can now also you can also use anonymous mode like this link here. I can send this out to you to try to. Actually, I should have done that. Let's try that. Um, let's see if I can chat this link to you, and you can try to submit your form you're actually able to submit to this list, fill out an order form, and we'll refresh our lists here to see your orders, I guess. So you don't necessarily have, you know, each of your users don't need SharePoint credentials in order to access any forms viewer um, form. Um, okay, and if anybody's trying to submit a form but we're not seeing it yet, we can wait. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm not seeing anybody trying to submit, um, but if you are trying, okay, here we go. We got one from Frank Castle. So you see that your item is here, even though you're not a member of our SharePoint site, you're able to submit that um, item. Let's check the order items list if you did submit any items. And you wanted a leather jacket, got your order, sir. All right. So yeah, that's working solution. Um, not sure if uh, I was able to answer your question, Tim, but definitely Forms Viewer does have um, layers of security. If you need more answers to that, or if you need more information on that, they can uh, take that. We can take that offline. Um, let me see. I think I'm seeing another question here. Okay. From Tim Still, this forms viewer take the place of InfoPath after Microsoft discontinues. Uh, we're not here to really like take over. We're here as your uh, as one of your options towards your migration path, because, um, like you said, Microsoft will not necessarily discontinue InfoPath, but will will start will stop supporting InfoPath, right? So. Um, to those of you who have a ton of InfoPath forms, especially, we are providing you a solution that will still allow you to you make use of your existing InfoPath forms. And that um, uh, this browser support forms viewer is going to allow you to do just that and even more that uh, your stock InfoPath form services don't allow. Okay. All right, I think that's it for today's webinar. Um, thank you for being so attentive, especially Tim. Thank you for all those questions. Um, uh, please fill out the survey at the end of this webinar and you'll be sure to receive the goodies, the sample templates, sample forms that we've shown you today. And if you need more help in your forms, you can feel free to contact support at kidabra.com. We'd be happy to assist. Okay, enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Thanks for attending again. Take care. Bye-bye.